today I'm going to talk mainly about um, our research related to computer vision and, and the really interesting research we are doing together with the Finnish company called Connect Cranes. But before that, I, I also want to say a few words. I, I want to uh, talk a bit about the research that our research group at the University of Helsinki, our research group called Space Short Temporal Data Analysis for Sustainability Science does. And then I, I really am planning to watch the, the time so that I, I don't kind of like go over the time and, and, and that I would have enough time for your uh, questions and discussions. But I want to say a few words about also FGUI's new highlight that Luigi also mentioned already, and a few words about the virtual laboratory that we are running in accordance to, or, or jointly with, with the research uh, group on autonomous systems with the highlight, because it's also very uh, closely related to today's topic. And I, I guess, Luigi, you already said also that I'm also very happy to get any questions and comments already during the presentation, because the thing that I'm most waiting for when this situation ends is that the feeling of, of really giving this presentation to someone who is also interacting and not talking here alone. But OK, so, so I said at the University of Helsinki, at the Department of Computer Science, we have a research group called Spatial Temporal Data Analysis or Sustainability Science, so SDA in, in short. And then the goal of our uh, research is to develop uh, mainly machine learning methods uh, for mobility and, and enabling the, the use of autonomous systems and doing this all for then uh, helping the creation of sustainable smart cities for the future. And the spatial temporal term comes from the fact that what we do use for our as, as our data is a navigation data, so position uh, and motion related data. And then so we are uh, aiming at forming accurate and reliable navigation data. And then, of course, also then using that for then uh, creating these autonomous systems and, and smart cities for the future. And then if you are interested to, to hear more or read more, you can go to our web pages that you can find following this link. And also, as I said, so we are very active members of FCI, of course, but also of Helsinki Institute of Sustainability Science and Helsinki Center for Data Science, so HELSUS and High Data. So in, in practice, what we then do is, is that we develop um, machine learning methods uh, for understanding the signal abnormalities and then for the signals, the location signals that we use are global navigation satellite signals or, or systems signals, so GNSS, and then, then also 5G signals for positioning purposes. And then we work a lot with computer vision systems that we will be more talking about today uh, related to SLAM, so understanding the motion of the systems. And then also about 3D object detection that I will also briefly mention today. And then also in our research, we do multi-sensor fusion and, and traffic modeling. And then, yeah, so in addition to the signals and computer vision, we also use different sensors as data sources. And here, just kind of like quickly showing you our great big group. So, so we are working also at, at so said, uh, three different application domains. So uh, reinforcement learning for traffic, where we have at the moment one FKI postdoc and then one PhD researcher, and, and hopefully two new postdocs coming very soon. And, and then on the GNSS field, we have also one postdoc and then one PhD researcher. And then on the computer vision side, we have two PhD researchers and one research assistant working at the moment. And then we have different projects related to these. But then let's go to, to today's uh, main topic. So I, I promised to talk about then how, how the computer vision can now help in industrial, uh, achieving the industrial goals. And then especially now looking from the sustainability viewpoint. So, so for, for the industrial premises to be also sustainable, we have to improve the safety. So of course, we must be sure that, that there are no accidents happening in the industrial premises. And the hope also of, of the uh, big companies is to get also these uh, machines to be working on autonomous mode. So, for example, the cranes to be autonomous at, at some time. And this, of course, means that, that uh, to, for having these big autonomous systems in the industrial premises, they must be able to locate themselves. So, so they must know their position all the time. And also then they must be 
uh, sure that they are not hitting anything that is around in the surroundings. And as we will be now talking about uh, then the situation that, that uh, we uh, see when we are at the industrial um, settings, so, so we usually have cameras that are looking downwards. And th this is quite challenging then for the computer vision methods. And, and then in, in addition to be, being kind of like making sure that we have safe systems and, and we know what is happening all around, of course, then we also want to have some efficiency. So we have want to have low power consumption of, of the computation that we do, of the equipment that we have. And also, of course, the companies then want to do this all with low cost equipment. And then nowadays, uh, the localization of the cranes, for example, is done mainly by using LIDARs, using really good uh, equipment that provide us quite good location and motion information. But they both violate this low cost and, and low power requirements. And then therefore, in our research, we are now using monocular, so normal cameras, which is giving us quite many challenges, as we will be talking about soon. And then the project that we are working at is, is uh, done with the donation from the, the Finnish company Connect Cranes. And then the collaboration has been really fruitful for, for both sides, I, I would hope. But OK, so, so let's then, then go a bit into the uh, details what we are doing here. So as I said, so we want to now know exactly the location of the crane. So we want to localize the crane all the time. And for that, there are already um, good solutions called uh, simultaneous localization and mapping techniques, so SLAPs. And in our research, we are now uh, developing deep learning based uh, localization and mapping methods. And actually, in this case, we are calling them structure from motion methods that, that you will find the reason for that a bit later. But, but they are actually providing quite similar information. So, so the ego motion of the system and at the same time information about the structures of the environment. And then also we want to get so-called 3D multi-object detection. So we want to know what are the things in the surroundings and in addition to knowing what the things there are, we want to know the location. And in this case, in, in 3D. So we want to really be sure that we don't hit any of the objects in the environment. OK, so, so we have to go a bit um, into the um, computer vision basics here, or nothing that much, but, but so that it's easier for you to follow. So when we uh, look at the 3D world, points. So we present them here with X. So having coordinates X, Y, and Z. So when we uh, take an image, we do something called perspective projection. So we project the 3D world points into 2D plane in the, on the image. And of course, then we lose some information. So we present the image points with X, having coordinates X and Y. And, and for you who know something about, or you have studied computer vision, you know that this is a simplified presentation, but, but I'm, I'm not going to talk, start talking about homogeneous coordinates or anything. So this is enough. We are now staying in the Euclidean geometry here. So what do we really get here when we take then the image points is that we get the um, uh, image uh, coordinates X and Y, so that we divide uh, the X uh, 3D, uh, world point uh, coordinate with the Z, so the distance to the point, so also called depth of the point. And the same for the Y coordinate. And then, then we have here something called F, which is a local uh, focal length of the camera, and that is related to something called camera calibration that, that I will very briefly also uh, mention later here. But so we have camera calibration done for the camera. So we do know the camera characteristics. And then we present these so-called intrinsic parameters with the matrix K here. OK, so, so what kind of information does this then bring to our localization question? So, so the changes of the pixel position, so the image coordinates in consecutive images, we may convert this information into the changes of the camera location, so so-called so camera pose. So we have here two images, so X uh, or, or on the left and the right. And on the left image, we have image point X. And on the right, we have image point X prime. So now these two uh, 
image coordinate locations x and x prime, they are then related to each other by this camera calibration information, the rotation, so how much the camera has rotated between taking the two images presented here with matrix R, and then uh, translation, so how much the camera has moved between taking the two images shown here with T, but divided with this jet, this depth information. And this is now something that is creating us as a bit of issues here when we are working with monocular cameras. But this is kind of like in the basis of how we do get the information about the motion of the camera. And of course, when the camera is attached to the crane, we also get the motion of the crane. Okay, but as said, so, so this is so-called depth issue when we are working with computer vision and using these normal monocular cameras. We don't get the depth in, in information. So we have an ambiguous scale, so which is apparent in, in both in motion and then on object detection. So we don't really get the metric scale of our motion if we don't have the depth. We know just kind of like the relative motion, but of course, when we want to locate something, we want to know exactly how many meters or centimeters it, it has moved. So there has been many different ways of, of kind of like used for detecting then this depth. I'm, I'm not going deep into this, but, but we can use stereo or RGBD cameras. So, so also providing the depth automatically from stereo images, we can compute that. We can use a set laser scanners. They provide also the depth information uh, always uh, with, with the other measurements. And, and what is mainly done is, is that we are, and, and of course, if we know something about the sizes of the objects in the environment, we can just use that for computing then the depth or when what is usually done is that we estimate that by motion, so when we are using SLAM or structure from motion. But still, there are some issues with the accuracy of that. So when we talk about uh, computer vision, so, so the, the networks that we talk about are convolutional neural networks, not with the typo that I have added here, so CNNs. And the CNNs, they are just simply neural networks that use uh, convolutions uh, in place of general matrix multiplications at least in at least one of the layers. And then they are really good for computer vision because they now also take into account these spatial relations. Because if you think about the images, so you know that independent pixels, they don't really provide you that much information. But when you look at the neighboring pixels, so then you usually find they are already something that is representative. So that's why we use CNNs for, for then uh, in all kind of like machine learning in computer vision. And the CNNs have already been used for then detecting this depth from monocular images. And then that, that is done already quite much, but, but the papers that usually uh, describe the methods, they don't really analyze how is it done. So they just say that, okay, so they use uh, two uh, convolutional neural network modules, one detecting the high level features and, and the other for detailed features. And they are usually based on, on uh, networks called ResNets. And, and the ResNets are, are ones that uh, get us input activation from the previous layers. And then they do have an identity function that reduces the error, or then it doesn't do anything if there is no learning happening. And then they enable us to have deeper networks. And, and, and of course, this way we will, or, or kind of like in the way that they don't <coughs> degrade the performance, but keep also the performance in good stage. But I said that the problem is that the, the papers discussing these methods, they don't really analyze that, that what is, what are the, the visual cues or, or kind of like what are the, the basis that they do the depth estimation with. So there has been one really good paper that tried to, to get some understanding of what do these networks really base then the depth estimation on. So they did analyze that, that there are some pictorial cues that do contribute to the depth estimation. So for example, we can look, look at different text density and then, uh, position of, of the objects in the images, occlusion and so on. And they also detected that the uh, convolution neural networks, they usually use a vertical position of objects in the image to estimate the depth. Okay, so, so this sounds interesting and, and good. 
But now if, if we think about our viewpoint, so, so here on the bottom, you can see pictures taken from the cranes that we have uh, used for, for collecting the data. In our uh, viewpoint, we are not really able to detect. So what is the vertical position of the objects? Because we are now having a camera that is looking straight down to the floor. So therefore, we have to then do something different. And, and so we started looking at, at what is the, the state of the art of, of the methods for now, then solving this, this depth information. And, and we found something really interesting called unsupervised scale consistent depth and ego motion learning from monocular video that was uh, published in NeurIPS a few years ago. And this has now all the, the important parts that, that also our um, processing needs. So we, of course, want to have the, the training done unsupervised. So, so we, we don't want to uh, be forced to, to collect a huge amount of, of images and then label those and, and then do the training. So we want to estimate now the echo motion because we are also looking at the motion. And as I said, we want to use the monocular uh, cameras and, and videos for the, the uh, sustainability reasons mentioned already. And of course, we now want to have the scale consistent so that we will now get the real metric motion. But, but then we also noticed that the, even the state of the art methods, they are, they are not enough for our cases. And then of course, as, as doing the, the research, we, that, that was what got, got us excited. And then therefore, we started then improving the, the state of the art methods so, so that they could also uh, cope with our viewpoint. And here on, on the right, you can see the, the results uh, from a master's thesis of, of my um, PhD researchers nowadays, so, so Niklas Josvik. He was looking at, at how does then the state of the art uh, kind of like processing uh, provide for the depth information. When on the left, you can see the, the actual images, and, and on the right, you can see the predicted depth of, of the images or the objects in the images. But then to, to then improve this depth estimation, and therefore also, of course, then our localization estimation, we needed to do some, some tricks. So we wanted to do some angle alignment. So, so when I said, so, so the, when the uh, camera moves, it, it changes its, its uh, orientation, so it rotates, and also it changes its position. So, so there is rotation. And of course, now this rotation of the camera, it will then give some degradation for the depth uh, estimation. So we wanted to get uh, rid of, of this, this rotation uh, induced error. Then also we wanted to take also then the temporal domain here. So we wanted to have multi-image input so that we can also, because of course, when we are having motion, then we have a lot of information that we might lose some information when taking one image, but something that we could carry on from, from the previous images. And then of course, we wanted to build this into scale consistent pipeline. And, and this is then how our network, so-called enhanced structure from motion learner looks like. So, so uh, we have the loss function where we look at, at three different things. We are looking at the photometric um, error there, which comes from the fact that how do the pixels in the images change? How, how do, does the intensity values of the pixel change? So meaning that uh, is our result really consistent? We want to good look at a geometric um, loss, and, and that's something that here is in the picture, and I will explain a bit closer later. And then also we want to look at something like smooth uh, loss, which comes from the fact that sometimes we don't really see any good textures. We are not really able to detect anything from the skin, and therefore we need something that will accommodate when our photometric loss computation fails. But OK, so, so what happens here in the network is that we do have now two images. We have this source, source image uh, on top left, uh, shown with IS. And then, then the, the image from the second time epoch, when our camera has moved a bit, uh, presented here with the name target image and IT. So we put this both to our convolutional neural network called BOSNET. And we get from the postnet, of course, the blocks that, that show then the rotation and translation of the camera between the images. So we are able to get there out the rotation information. And we use this rotation information into kind of like unrotating 
than our images. So taking out the effect that the camera rotation between the two images has created into our estimates. And then we put into also uh, our convolutional neural network, the, the networks, the other, other part uh, called DefNet, uh, the information uh, that we get from these uh, unrotated images. So when we are detecting now the depth of, of the source image, we put there the information of the unrotated target image and also the uh, plain source image. And then the same for the uh, target image and, and the unrotated source image. And from this, we do get two uh, depth maps. And, and then uh, if you can see, see my mouse. So, so here uh, we are showing that how when we do um, have the source image points at the epoch T minus one, and we do get the pose information shown here with big uh, matrix P. So we have the uh, pose information. We are able to estimate by doing something called inverse warping where our target image points should be. When we use the uh, depth map and the uh, coming from the depth net and the pose information coming from the pose net. So we are able to estimate where the image points should be. And by having this information, we are then able to relate the two um, depth images that we have acquired uh, but from the two images and, and by doing this processing. And we are able to, to see that how well those two depth maps are in accordance and then compute the loss based on, on the, the error that there exists. Okay, so, so this is now how we get then the, the geometric error. Then also, as said, we want to now, uh, and the error mainly in the, the depth estimation. So then also we want to have then uh, the information about how is, is then kind of like the whole chains of the pose affecting the, the pixel values that we find from the two images. So are they still consistent? And, and, and then we do this by looking at the photometric error in the way that, that we do know now uh, the, the 2D image points uh, fr from uh, one image. And then we look at how they are projected to their 3D real world points by using now the depth information that we have gotten from the depth. And then we, we map these 3D uh, image uh, ob object points that we have now computed to the other image. So for example, if we started, started with the target image, image points, we are, have now projected those into the 3D objects visible in the image. And then we are doing, uh, we, we know where they should be based on our pose. And then we back project those back to the 2D image in the source image. So now we should be getting the real actual pixels that there are in the source image. And how much these two then differ is then providing the information for our photometric loss. Okay, so, so then definitely we wanted to then test so how, how good is now our estimation here. So we did uh, use uh, two benchmark data sets, uh, so something called indoor depth benchmark NYU depth um, data set that has gone the, the in real indoor environments, images of real indoor environments. But as you can see here in a bit from with, with a bit different viewpoint than in our case. And then also we use something called steel box that is artificial data set. And then based on our uh, kind of like computation with our, our network, uh, the, the depth solution in the middle shows that we are getting quite similar solution as with the, the state of the art methods in this a bit more uh, feasible uh, environment. But then of course, as I said, we have quite challenging viewpoint for our own Research. So, of course, we wanted then to also collect our own data and then get the real images from, from the real cranes. And, and for this, we collaborated with Aalto University's Ilmatar test crane and, and, and the laboratory um, handling that. And, and so we did calibrate the cameras by, by using this kind of like chessboard picture that is used quite common and, and probably the, the most feasible way of, of getting then the um, calibration for the camera. 
And, and then we, we had uh, for our ground truth, we had a LIDAR that, that really provided us the accurate depth. And then for the cameras, we used a very cheap and, and, and small real sense uh, uh, cameras for collecting then the monocular images. And then we did test uh, the, the method with our own data. And, and we noticed that we do outperform the state of the art previous methods with our new uh, network. So, so here on the top, we get the, the images from this uh, structure from motion, motion learner, the basic one, and then on the below uh, with our own, own method. And then also something with the numbers. So we did uh, uh, here on the bold are the numbers that we do get from our computation, the, the relative depth information. And then as you can see with the bold, so, so we are uh, exceeding the, the uh, uh, the, the uh, results from the structure from motion learner and, and then uh, on the, the bottom I'm, I'm also showing that how does this then really relate to the motion information of the crane because so far we have been concentrating on improving the depth for our difficult viewpoint but of course in the future our goal is also then to get the actual location information but but here on the bottom is uh, kind of like how then the developers of the original structure from motion learner relate then this um, kind of like this relational depth uh, information into the improvement of the actual location information. So here on the, the T error is, is the um, error in the translation and the R error is the error in the rotation. So, so they have improved already uh, significantly with the structure from motion learner and then when we have again improved then the depth information we anticipate that this will then improve even more and then uh, just a few words about then the, the uh, research that how we are now going to continue is, is also as said so we then want to get this 3D object understanding. So as I said, we have to know where the, all the objects are in the environment. So, so humans, static objects, and then we want to know where they are with respect to the observer. But there again, the same thing is that when we are now using the monocular cameras, we have to solve the depth. And then by being now able to, to get the depth information of the environment, we should also be able to, to get much more accurate uh, 3D object information. But then also we have some other uh, challenges in, in this industrial environment. So we have a lot of featureless surfaces, so, so, so floor where there are no objects and, and that of course makes it quite complicated to get understanding out of that. And also some non-Lambertian surfaces, so something very shiny, which has not really been the problem for navigation research generally uh, because they in, in normal indoor environments they are quite rare but in our industrial premises there are actually quite uh, common so, so we also are developing methods for then coping with those and then also continuing the, the computer vision research for pedestrians that, that I have personally been doing for for years already when of course we then have another constraints there when we have very non-restricted motion and, and on all other things coming from having these small uh, users or carrying the equipment. But then I, I know that I'm, I'm uh, coming close to the end of my time, but as I said, I, I want to still say a few words just quickly when, when I have this great audience here about then the, the new highlight F uh, of FKI, so uh, highlight called AI for sustainability, where the objective is of course then to tackle these these uh, big problems that are um, harming the, the mankind at the moment. So, so United Nations has given the goals of ending poverty and other deprivations that, that uh, are harming the health and education and, and providing inequality to the world and, and also kind of like spurring the economic growth. And of course, as we all know, we have to tackle for the, against the climate change. And then for that, then the F guys um, highlight F is aiming at, at trying to recognize and, and then help and, and boost all the great um, results and innovations that we do in F guy community. And, and then to kind of like use those for then also tackling these, these um, problems and, and achieving the sustainability goals. 
And then there are already great research going on. And then at the moment, we are just in the form or, or in the phase of trying to identify and then definitely promote the innovations that we do in the great FKI community. And just very preliminary picture of how good the state actually is already. This is still missing few uh, research uh, programs of FKI and, and I, I guess still some of the highlights and, and I'm in the process of collecting the remaining information, but we can already see that our research is already addressing many of these uh, United Nations sustainable development goals already at the moment. So just trying to identify and, and then to promote the great research we do. And the, the first, like last words about, about uh, this FKI's uh, uh, work at, at the moment. So already uh, or, or we, we are also in, in the phase of uh, kind of like establishing something called virtual laboratories for, from different viewpoints inside FKI. And, and the uh, virtual laboratory that I am uh, together with Professor Ville Kyrki from Aalto uh, now establishing is called Sustainable Mobility and Autonomous Systems. And, and so I said, this is a joint laboratory of, of uh, this new highlight and, and then the research program six called Autonomous AI. And in the virtual laboratory, our goal is, is to do different simulations based on reinforcement learning for autonomous driving and, and of course having their very strong sustainability view then. And, and kind of like the, the tasks that we are at the moment working on, but, but kind of like these are not restrictive or exclusive are fusion of results from various simulations and, and then trying to close the reality gap on the topic. And, and then uh, we already have a great postdoc group working on, on the efficiency of the computation. And then also our goal is to collaborate with the sustainability professors also bringing then the strong sustainability viewpoint in there. But yes, I, I think that this was all that I had prepared now and I, I would be really happy to, to discuss with you and, and, and reply if you have any questions. Thanks, Laura, fantastic talk. So yeah, we already have actually some questions coming in and uh, yeah. So uh, I just, should I just read it? Uh, Anna is asking. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but you can read it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, what do you think will be the risk of AI? Sorry, that was you... my, yeah. oh, yes. my clock <laughs> so, started talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so what do you think the risk of AI? Of course, not those that, you know, that uh, Elon Musk talking about, but let's say other ones. <laughs> okay, what are the risks of AI? Okay, so, so I, I would say that the, the AI doesn't provide the risks, but, but people using AI are the ones who are usually providing the risks, but I, I think this relates to all technologies. But, but probably if, if talking about this um, research that we are doing with the cranes, of course, then kind of like the risk here most likely is, is the um, difficult explainability of, of the networks. I, I would say that that is definitely, and this is probably one reason why it's taking quite long before these will really be taking into practical use these different deep learning methods. Because of course, when we are talking about industrial premises, then the um, kind of like the users or the companies, they must be able to kind of like certificate uh, the, the, the methods that they use. And then I think that will be quite difficult for for them to be done in, in the very near future, but, but very important research point too. But, um, well, I, I would again say that the biggest risk of, of AI would probably be that, that people are not pay, sometimes paying attention to what they are doing. So, so you have to know the data that you use and then you have to know what comes out from the use of the data. So, so maybe that would be in, in short a reply to that. If that, that was what you were looking for. Thanks. Any other question? Otherwise, I have some, but first from the audience. Okay, while we wait, maybe other questions. So, yeah, actually, so first of all, yes, thanks for the fantastic overview, really interesting work. And so, yeah, actually, I have a couple of questions. So, the first one, um, this will probably interest both me and Marcus. It's about uncertainty. So, I mean, it looks like it's very important, let's say, to judge 
uh, say, besides getting an estimate, you want to have uncertainty about, okay, you know, this, this debt. So how do you handle that? Is that built in? Do you have any method to, to deal with that? Um, well, 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 yeah, I would say that then it's kind of coming from computing these different losses, but of course, then the uncertainty comes from. So I, I would say that there are many ways when we have this like three uh, sections of, of the loss computations, I would say that that's at, at the moment the, the way that we are handling that. But definitely, as I said, looking at, at kind of like how the post relates to the motion and, and then also looking at the pixel values themselves. Okay, now the most thing is essentially so when the, whether your, your network is giving you a point estimate, so just an estimate, or it's also giving you essentially a full distribution of potential debts. So essentially, I'm asking essentially if you're using Bayesian neural networks or anything close to that. No, no, we are not. No, sorry. No, okay. no, uh, no, not yet. So as I said, the research yes. is in, in starting phase. So definitely we are all the time looking for. And, and as, as I also said, so this is definitely so kind of like getting then the, the reliability measures and everything is really, really important. And when we are getting closer to the phase that this would really be taking into the use in industrial like setups. So, so definitely we are starting the research, but, but these are things that we have to yeah. then also discuss when getting closer to that phase. Yeah, because, yeah, it looks like it's an interesting, very interesting application because you know you, you it would be useful to get uncertainty estimates out, out of it. Yeah. And and, and actually, as maybe you say, it's another question. So, uh, you were talking about the depth estimates. So, my, my background is in computational neuroscience. And uh, actually, one of the things we've been doing is a Q combination, which is combining different Qs. I haven't worked specifically on depth estimation, uh, but that's a very common uh, say, domain in which, say, uh, cognitive scientists and, uh, well, perceptual scientists look into because exactly you know how brain estimates cues uh, i mean it's, it's very important and it's very interesting and that's exactly actually i mean and the big question is okay so how do we how do we combine information so let's say the, the, the thing you were looking at essentially how neural networks uh estimate that so which kind of cues they use I mean, it reminded me a lot to say these kind of studies that they're done in you know, cognitive science and in the perception of science etc and yeah. one thing that is found there is that exactly, I mean, one of the things I, I mean, I was interested in is the fact that the brain weighs cues depending on the uncertainty. And, you know, so it's, it's useful to have a measure of uncertainty of the cues themselves, because then uh, the system, whether it's a brain or a neural network or, you know, artificial or new, so knows how to weigh different cues. And uh, I mean, in humans is found that yes, humans weigh them according to the Bayesian <laughs> the yeah. principles. So, so I was wondering exactly. So, especially uh, uh, of course, say the question here is that: uh, is, do, Are you aware, or you know, uh, of any work that looks at this uh, kind of Q combination in terms of okay, how much weight is given to different cues? And uh, you know, so and can we provide more information to the networks such that they can learn to maybe combine cues better? No, I, I, unfortunately, no, no. And I, I think that was quite new, the paper that I, I was presenting that was even looking at how mm -hmm. do these networks uh, estimate the depth. Because that was for quite a long time. It, it wasn't really even uh, asked. So, so that was, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. Just say, okay, so there, there is a very long history of this science. Yeah, that. but for our <laughs> case, we definitely have to ask because we don't have these yeah. normal cues that are presented. In there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. very interesting. Yeah, and so you know, just to see connection to with uh, with other work, and that might be interesting to, to kind of to yeah. explore. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any anything else from the public? Uh, I guess I was wondering. Uh, it uh, it was really interesting to see the um, the sort of unsupervised version of how you how you estimate depth like this. And, and I was wondering, it also seems like with the Crane and Alto, you have also a very good source of supervised data if you were to like put a binocular camera on that. Yeah. So I guess I was curious what the, I mean, I get, I assume part of it is that in a new industrial setting, you know, you won't, you'll be trying to estimate depth in a, in a sort of different setting than you would from the training. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so did, did I understand your question correctly? So, so yeah. why do we, why do we want to do it in, in this way or? Yeah, exactly. I suppose I didn't finish the question, but yeah, why, why the, uh, especially the focus on the unsupervised part? 
on, on the unsupervised. Well, of course, that what is kind of like our wish for, for then the future is that these would be really generalizable so that they could be used in, in very different environments so that we wouldn't be building this. And then this is, of course, also the, the hope for the connect grains for the future so that they would have something very scalable and, and easily transferable. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, perfect, perfect timing and <laughs> that requires mastery. <laughs> Congrats. Uh, we, okay, uh, I think I said it's uh, all for today. And I mean, thanks again, Laura. Laura has been fantastic having you here, especially after, you know, you've been sharing this for three years. And yeah. it's good to finally <laughs> having you talk and hearing you. So thanks, let's thank you again, Laura. Let's say, I mean, with a virtual club. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and see you all uh, next week for another seminar. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.